All right, mics are here, clicker is here. Please tell me video is private. I'm telling it to stream publicly and it's going private. All right. Now it seems to be coming up. All right. Okay. Yeah, I think we're up. That. So from what I was driving today in my you know, it's like one was a so, oh, your computer, the USB thing is in your computer. USB thing is right here. That's why it's not working. I don't see the same thing working. I steal the thing computer, but. So this was sixty dollars. Yeah. Oh, oh, the thing going. Yeah. You put it in, you go like that. Yeah, even that slide. Yeah, and the, I have a couple for the energy chart. So where's the ribbon? So they're in a separate cup. So so it was pretty easy. Yeah, I could see the pattern spot on the there. So here I am. I already have problems now. My phone is in like right. It's one of those things. So I just need to know. So when you think it'll be good, you have to field over just as good. Uh, whatever you think works best. Which one? I did have Paula's name. Yeah, um, and I'll just along come with up the reports. Night. All right, then now I'll just come up. Then have to come up twice because after the reports That's are the. Yeah. Okay. Is that all right with you? Yeah. All right. Let's check our yeah. volume is up. We're good to go. We're on long. Okay. Did you have one? They think about her and think it's an That's it. That's it. Oh, no, we're well over. I was in there. So, she knows like I said, Thank you. And like, I don't understand. I don't Welcome, everybody. Welcome, everyone here and everyone on YouTube. Yeah. This is the October meeting, monthly meeting of the Delaware Valley Amateur Astronomers. And it's a special night tonight because we have a joint meeting with the Southeast PA section of the American Association of Physics Teachers. And we have many representations of both groups. It's a great, great joint meeting uh, for us because we have so many overlapping interests and it's really, we really appreciate meeting everyone. So just because we have so many new people in the audience, I thought we'd do a couple of slides on to tell you about the DVAA. So the Delaware Valley Amateur Astronomers is not Delaware County. It's the whole Delaware Valley. So we're, we're including many counties in the Philadelphia area, most especially Delaware County, as well as Montgomery County, probably some from Philadelphia, a few from Bucks. We're a nonprofit volunteer run organization of amateur astronomers based in the Philadelphia area. We are have all kinds of uh, backgrounds, dentists, coders, photographers, you name it, doctors, students, and we're just united by our love of astronomy as a hobby. Our mission, and this is from our bylaws, I didn't make this up, is to aid and encourage amateur astronomers in observation and scientific research projects, to encourage cooperation and the exchange of ideas among amateur astronomers, and to interest and educate the general public in the science of astronomy. We have lots of public outreach activities. We have monthly public star parties, which we hold at Valley Forge National Historical Park. We have monthly astronomy-related presentations, and that's what we're doing tonight. 
We have other star parties, solar observing and educational presentations, which we jointly sponsor with community organizations, schools and universities, libraries, scouting groups, various people who contact us and want to incorporate an astronomy element in whatever else they're doing. And we also have uh, youth awards, awards to uh, uh, youth in our area who have done specific projects. And we, uh, we do a judging and award prizes. Our member activities, so that, that, that's what we do with the general public. Our member activities include uh, dark sky observing and astrophotography, which we do together because it's a collegial uh, type activity. We have how-to clinics where we help people who are our members learn to operate their telescopes or their camera equipment or their binoculars, um, help them learn the sky and help them feel better about, uh, about the, what they knew about astronomy. We have astrophotography workshops. We have telescope rentals. And you can see one of the telescopes there that we, uh, that we rent. We have a lot of, uh, oops. Hmm. Oh, you know, it's, it's turn it around. Turn it around. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> Yeah, so here's one of our rental telescopes. Here's one of the beautiful uh, uh, astrophotography examples that's taken by one of our members. And here's our one of our how-to clinics, which we held recently in Green Lane Park. We have a couple of outreach or a couple of upcoming events which I wanted to highlight either tomorrow or Sunday night, depending on the weather, we'll have a public star party in Valley Forge. Uh, we have a DVA board meeting on October 28th. So if there's anything you think should be discussed, mention it to one of the board members and we'll try to incorporate it uh, in our discussion. Is and it after, here? It is by Zoom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all by Zoom. Um, we have a, an astrophotography workshop. These generally happen, um, oops, sorry about that. These generally happen um, the Wednesday before our monthly meetings. So that's going to be held on the 15th. And then the next general monthly meeting after this one is on November 17th. And then we have our last public star party of the year on November 18th. So this is all that's going on this month in the uh, DVA world. And you're welcome to join us for any of these, these activities, except the board meeting, I guess. It's going the wrong way. <laughs> All right, I, I wanted to mention also, uh, we have an upcoming auction. And this is, uh, we do, we've, it's been three years since we had the last auction. So we have a lot of stuff to offer. It's everything that's been donated to us over the past three years. We have, uh, and the way it'll start is on November 11th, it will open online. And it's a little hard to see the, um, the address here, but it's uh, 32auctions.com slash DVA 2023. So what you can do online when you, when you see these, uh, see these, um, off, these items, it gives you an opportunity to research them, to see what, you know, what it is that, that we're offering, look around, get, get reviews, and, and decide whether you'd like to bid on it. If you'd like to bid, you can bid online, um, and then we'll transition to a live auction on December 17th at the Radnor Township building. So he, we'll be here. Uh, we'll have all the telescopes set up for you to physically examine them, plus all the equipment that, uh, it's not just telescopes, it's eyepieces and filters and um, accessories and so on. And this will give you the opportunity to examine everything and decide decide if you want to on bid. And we will have live bid. Some items we'll do silently, but we will have live bidding on a number of them. Yes, there's a question. Uh, it when it goes live, we'll put it on the website as a button. Yes. It's not there now because it it wouldn't it's not open so it would frustrate people. Yes. Yeah, we'll put a link right on the website to go straight to the auction uh, when it, when the auction's open November 11th. Yep. 
So uh, we're, I'm happy to see we got some donations tonight. Thank you very much. If you have anything else and you forgot to bring it tonight, something you'd like to donate, you can either bring it to the Valley Forge Star Party or you can uh, email me at president at dva.com, I mean, .org, sorry, um, right here. And we can figure out a way to, to uh, get the item into the auction. Um, this is a picture of the telescopes. There are 10 telescopes in the auction. The estimated marketing value is market value is 125 to 625. And the starting bids are 50 to 100 dollars So you could get some good equipment for, for pretty cheap uh, money. Okay. Now we have some uh, reports from members of, uh, of uh, DDA. Uh, APT. So I'd like to call on um, Jeremy. There you are. <laughs> well, I am not Paula Miller. <laughs> she was unable to make it tonight. She sends her regrets. So uh, she asked me to. Uh... Oh, did we share the screen? No, we didn't. Okay. So the people online are probably wondering why we're not viewing the screen. All right. Let us. That's the wrong one. Close down that slideshow. Why is it not closing the slideshow? <clears throat> there we go. Uh, just a second here. There we go. I'm now sharing the screen. All right. Sorry about like that. Oh, I'll use that. Or maybe I'll just use this one. All right, so welcome everyone. My name is Jeremy Carlo. I'm the uh, past president of AAPT uh, SEP, so I guess I'm still not completely off the hook. So I have a few more responsibilities. So how many of you are here from SEPs? All right, quite a few. All right, how many are here from the DVAA? All right, I think the DVA outnumbers a little bit. So when we have the fight in the parking lot afterwards, we might be in trouble. All right. So uh, the SEPS is holding its annual meeting, and we're doing uh, tonight's portion of it jointly with uh, the DVAA. We have a quick uh, little uh, overview of what's coming up. Uh, for this evening's meeting, we have uh, Paul Baker of Widener University as our invited speaker. And then tomorrow, we have a full day of events. We have several different speakers. So we have uh, Dr. Eric Rue from uh, Drexel University. He'll be our invited speaker in the morning. We'll also have a presentation from the National Energy Education Development uh, Organization. And then in the afternoon, we're going to have a whole bunch of contributed talks and demos, and that's going to be held down at Widener University. So a little is bit that, about us. Is that a good uh, you do have to register for it. So let's see. So uh, the Southeast Pennsylvania section of the AAPT uh, is a group. So the AAPT is a national organization, represents physics teachers at the high school and college level uh, throughout the country. So SEPS uh, primarily represents teachers in the sort of five county region uh, surrounding Philadelphia, but we do have some members from New Jersey, we have some members from Delaware, and a little bit outside of that range. Uh, it is kind of a nice local section. So unlike the AAPT, which holds nationwide meetings, which usually means you're flying out to them and staying at hotels, we have meetings that are local, so generally you can drive there in an hour or less than that. So a little bit about the National AAPT. This is a little bit of boilerplate uh, from their website. Uh, so that's a professional membership of scientists dedicated to enhancing the understanding and appreciation of physics through teaching. So they hold two annual meetings, uh, one in the summer, one in the winter. They usually do the planning pretty well. The winter meetings are usually down south somewhere. So the weather is a little bit more uh, decent. So the winter meeting is usually January. The summer meeting is usually in July. 
They also hold a bunch of uh, workshops throughout the year, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. That's uh, DE and I. Uh, a lot of job postings are on their website. Uh, they provide guidelines for evaluation of physics programs. It's actually one of the things that's been really useful for us at work. They have a lot of uh, guidelines of uh, how to enhance uh, enrollment and uh, programs and doing things like that. So our local uh, section here, I'd say it kind of provides a lower barrier to entry. Right? It's a little bit easier to get into uh, the conferences are a little less expensive and it provides an opportunity to make local connections. The teachers that are in uh, your local area, we have a pretty good mix of high school and college people. I put 50-50 here, but let's uh, take a little poll. How many of you are here from high schools? Yeah, quite a few. How many of you are here from colleges? I think the high school group uh, outnumbers a little bit, but uh, yes, yeah, so we do have a pretty good uh, mix there. So we usually do two meetings uh, per year. We usually do a demo day and we do a full meeting. Uh, we've kind of oscillated back and forth a little bit because of COVID, but usually one of those is in the spring, uh, one of those is in the fall. We also have a local email listserv, so there's a lot of job postings that go up there. Uh, discussion forum, which I'd like to have a little more active. Uh, the reason we set that up was so that people can communicate with each other. And we do get some uh, communications on that, but it'd be nice if we increased it a little bit more. Uh, we do hold some workshops. We haven't had too many in recent years, but maybe we'll get that uh, back up and running. And membership is $10 per year, which is uh, another great thing. So our officers, actually the year needs to be updated there. Uh, the president is Paula Miller, who's at Abraham Lincoln High School. Our VP is Ryan Backke, who's at UPenn. Our secretary is uh, Shin Du, who's in the back. I'm gonna wave. And she'll be organizing uh, the meeting on Saturday. So she's our local host there. Uh, treasurer is Mark Barron from Sun Valley. He's the guy you pay. Our section rep is Amber Stuber from Villanova. I'm the past president and Mark Sifonis is our webmaster. who's not an official board position. Yeah, Mark, Mark with a C. Still have to pay for the meeting, you know, just wave the dues, yeah. <laughs> All right, so that is my uh, presentation for this evening. So hopefully a lot of you will be at the meeting tomorrow. We do serve food. That's one of the, the benefits of it. All right, with that, I will uh, hand it back to Jen. I have a good job. go. <laughs> 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 Okay. Thank you, Jeremy. So next up is our welcoming chair, Brian Lee. And while he's coming up to the podium, I wanted to mention that our memberships, you'll notice, will expire uh, on December 31st, 2023. So you'll be getting a, uh, a notice from Club Express to uh, renew your membership if you're a DVA member currently. Um, if you join, if you're, if you're not a member currently and you want to join, don't worry, your membership won't expire until 2024, December of 2024. So you get an extra bonus there if you'd like to join in uh, October, November, December. Four, four months. Yeah, well, three months four, now. Three months now. <laughs> Plus four. Okay. Brian? I'm, I'm Brian Lee, the uh, welcoming chair. Uh, we have, it's kind of like this month, three new members, uh, Brett Cohen, Tony Ab uh, Abada, and uh, Joseph Gruber. And I didn't see any of them tonight, so, but give them a welcome. Okay, the other general announcement I have is that we will be holding uh, elections at the end of the year for in DVAA, um, electing officers for 2024. And we do have um, an opening for a member, a member at large. Um, Tracy has fulfilled her three years and she can't run anymore. So if you would like to be a member or volunteer to be a member at large, um, I'd like to hear from you. What is a member at large? 
Um, member at large is someone who um, rep is on, uh, on the board, on the board of DBAA, and they are empowered to represent the membership in decision making. So um, we like to have uh, some diversity in age and gender and race and any kind of diversity um, among the people that, that are on the uh, members at large. So if you'd like to see a little bit more about how DVA functions from the inside without necessarily having to work very hard, <laughs> that might be a good position for you. Okay, um, I thought it would be really good for uh, the physics teachers especially to hear a little more about our student uh, youth awards program. So I'd like to invite Al who um, developed this program and runs it to tell us a little bit about it. And then we have a special presentation. Over here. Yeah, we the DBA recently instituted a uh, youth award uh, program. Um, and it's geared for uh, middle school and high school students. Uh, for the teachers out there in the audience, if you go to our website on the main page, you'll see um, a, a button announcing youth awards for 2023-24. And if you just click on that, uh, you'll get some information uh, uh, describing what the awards are and um, what the criteria are. And it's a very basic outline of what the criteria are. I think the teachers, you know the drill. Uh, we look for uh, a very uh, clear uh, hypothesis with uh, with the data that supports or rejects it, uh, uh, a uh, clear presentation of the, the data that has been collected. Uh, and, uh, and we invite uh, the students to submit by May 1st of, uh, of 2024. You can submit uh, before that. And we have a small group of DVA members who are judges um, and um, we, uh, uh, collate the uh, the results and we issue awards. We this year we issued uh, two awards, uh, first place and second place, and uh, they were here. gave a presentation of their research to the group, and uh, they were also encouraged to submit their work to the Astronomical League, which is an umbrella organization of all the astronomy clubs in the U.S. and even international. And they have a Young Astronomers Award in uh, first place, second place, third place, and honorable mention. And one of our uh, members who uh, got first place, the DVA Award, uh, got third place nationally. So I'd like to invite Iftikhar uh, uh, Taruno to come on up. He did research on lava tubes on the moon. And we're going to present the test. Yeah. Just, here in the camera. <laughs> Al, you're in the projector lights and we've just been moving here. Very okay. hard life. Yeah. Give me a couple of minutes. I don't have my radar down with me. Well, maybe not minutes, but seconds. Great. Congratulations again. Thanks. Congratulations again. It's also published in the uh, Astronomical League's publication, uh, The Reflective. Thank you, Al. This has been a great program. And last year was our first year. We're really looking forward to having it grow this year, have more submissions, but it's just such a privilege to honor the young scientists in our area in this way, to get to know them, to hear what they're doing. Um, it's a lot of fun for us. And I encourage all of you in the, those of you who raised your hands uh, that are physics teachers at the high school level, please, uh, if you have a student that's interested in astronomy, 
let them know about this program. You bet. You bet. Okay. Now I'd like to invite Len Jensen, who's our past president, to uh, present the observing talk today. And it's on the local group in our galactic neighborhood. Oh. It's, it's better. I, I turned it off. So I was looking. Okay. Lewis, you're going to be my inspiration to Why only tonight? Always, especially tonight. We've been doing this for a year. Okay, well, hello, everyone. Um, tonight, I'm going to do a talk that's a little bit different than the talk that I presented last month. Last month, if you recall, it was on however you want to. I don't know. Is it? How do I? It's a slider. Is there a slider on you? Yep, on the top. Oh. Got it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So last month, I spoke a little bit on something called the zodiacal light, or I still like to pronounce it the zodiacal light, even though that's not the right pronunciation. And, but I, it flows better, I think. And so tonight, I thought, I don't know, I was trying to wrap my brain for another topic. And for some reason, in the last week and a half, two weeks, I've just been thinking about Mr. Rogers and his <laughs> little song, you know, about, Welcome to My Neighborhood. Honestly, I'm not making that up. And I thought, well, you know what, this is a great time of year because you can see a large representation of what's called the local group. And you could extend out a little bit further. And it includes the galactic neighborhood. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And I started thinking also about the derivation of the word galaxy, and it comes from the Greek galaxia. Does anybody know what that means? No, no. I'll tell you. It means milky. And I also happen to find, thanks to Wikipedia, this little quote up here from Geoffrey Chaucer. And this is the one of the oldest known references in English to the use of the word galaxy. It's from a poem that goes back to about the mid 1300s. See yonder low the galaxy, which men clepeth the Milky Way, for it is white. Which got me to thinking about the word clepeth. And I didn't know what that meant either. But tonight I will be clepething about the Milky, uh, about the local group. It means to call. Or to name. So it's which men call or call it the Milky Way. Um, I think I'm hitting the right button here. Ah, there we go. Okay, so what exactly is the local group? Well, it's basically just our neighborhood. It's our not the solar system, not our arm of the galaxy, but it's a little bit more extensive in nature. It's a group of galaxies that are gravitationally related to one another. And it's fairly extensive by our human standards, but it's very, very small in terms of the standards of the size of the universe. Does anybody know the first person to clepeth our area um, as the local group? No. Nope. It goes back to this guy. Hit the button. There it is. It's our famous pal. A narcissist, a brute, an egotistical kind of a genius, but this is Edwin Hubble. And he refers to it in chapter six of The Realm of the Galaxies, which was published in about 1936. And he did, if you recall, distance measurements to galaxies. And he noted that there were a number of galaxies that had redshifts that indicated they were closer to us. And he called that grouping, that's much smaller grouping than what we know it is now, the local group. So that goes back to about 1936 or so. So it's actually a pretty old uh, designation. This is a picture of him looking through the 48-inch Palomar Ocean schmidt tassegrain And I'm going to make reference to this a little bit later in the talk, too. You can also get this book as a Dover reprint. It's a really interesting book to read. So let's take a look at this picture. 
And I was really frustrated when I tried to find good illustrations of the spatial relationships amongst the galaxies and objects within the local group. Um, they have all these lines on them that point to objects with the little name down there. It's just busy. So it's a little frustrating. However, what we're looking at here is the most local portion of the local group. And centered in here is the galaxy, our galaxy, which actually they have uh, depicted as a, as a barred spiral, which we now think the galaxy happens to be, the Milky Way happens to be. And you can see a couple of the larger, more prominent satellite galaxies, the large Magellanic Cloud, the small Magellanic Cloud. Are those the closest satellites to our Milky Way? It turns out that they're not. The Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy, which is here, is the closest. And that's something that's actually visible even with a decent pair of binoculars in the summer sky. To give you an idea of size, take a look at this. This, is a, this little tick is about 100,000 light years. So we're looking at about maybe six or 700,000 light years across here. Seems like a vast distance. But if you think about how far it is to our nearest large neighbor, which happens to be the Andromeda galaxy right over here at about 2.2 to 2.3 million light years. This is not such a large scale right over here. But let's go back to this. And of course, then we have the next largest member of the local group, which is right down here, which is M33, the great triangular galaxy. This is a little confusing too, uh, with this grid up here and this grid down here. This spans a much larger um, portion of the of our galaxy, and it gives you the relative locations, two dimensionally at least, of a lot of the satellite galaxies. So the Milky Way actually has its own satellite galaxies, M thirty one, the Andromeda Galaxy, and M thirty three, the Triangulum, have their own satellite galaxies. They're not just gravitationally related; those satellites to the parent galaxy. But all these galaxies are gravitationally related to one another. And if we go a little bit further out yet, we can see our little local group. And the local group encompasses about 10 million light years across. It's a sphere about 10 million light years across. But here we are in the local group, and we're actually a portion of the Virgo supercluster. So everybody knows about the Virgo cluster of galaxies that you can see in the spring sky. That's just one portion of the Virgo supercluster. It's a much larger expanse that encompasses a couple of hundred million light years, 110 million light years, something in that range that may be off a little bit, but it's a much larger um, structure. But that's buried within a structure that's even larger called the Laniakia supercluster. So here we are. That's the local group right down here. This is the Virgo supercluster that we just saw in the previous slide. And that's a part of this giant cluster called the Laniakia cluster. Um, this is a Hawaiian term. I think that means enchanted sky. I forget what it is right now. My older memory is failing me. But you can look that up easily enough. And you might be wondering what all these lines are here. Well. Each of these lines represents the path, the gravitationally uh, dictated path of a galaxy or cluster within the supercluster. So there was a study of 8,000 individual galaxies in the Laniakia supercluster, and their movements were extrapolated from a variety of different proper motion studies that subtracted out the expansion of the universe. And this is what they came up with. These are pathways. So there's a gravitational mass here that affects an, uh, an influence in all the galaxies, including ours in here, in the supercluster. And then, of course, Laniakia is just a member of an even larger structure. And these are other superclusters of galaxies in our general region of the universe. And of course, the universe has a dimension of upwards of 90 billion or more light years. So you can expand and expand and expand. Are, are superclusters relatively the same size or do those also vary quite a bit? 
I don't know the answer, but I suppose you could say that any supercluster, statistically speaking, would be average, but I don't know what the upper and lower limits happen to be. Okay. And, that, and I don't know how that would be derived. And I don't actually know if there's a if there's any been yeah. research done like on that. So yeah, which you can see right, uh, uh oh, um, <laughs> wrong button, right over here. And we were just talking about histology before the meeting began. But if you look at pictures of the of the structure, the large scale scale structure of the universe, they look remarkably like structures like glial structures in the brain from a histologic or microscopic level. Okay, so we're going to pull back to the local group from that vast view that we just had. And we're going to take a look at the two, two of the three most prominent objects within the local group. The first one being M31, also called NGC 224. Now that's a naked eye object. And you can see that from a reasonably dark site with the naked eye. And you can see some structure with a pair of binoculars. But what I think is really fascinating is that with a larger telescope, 10 to 12 to 14 inches under a dark sky, you can star hop much the way that you would star hop using Tyrion's Atlas to find M13 in the sky or M35 or something that you can't see easily in your finder scope. You can do the same thing in the Andromeda galaxy and you can pick out globular clusters within the Andromeda galaxy. And there are four in particular that are within the range of the 12 to 14 inch telescope from a dark sky site. And the most prominent is called G1. And this is a picture of G1 taken with a Hubble, but G1 lies somewhere down here. And I know that because I've actually seen that through a 12 inch telescope from Potter County. And it appears as a distinctly unstar-like object. It's fuzzy. And here you are looking at a globular cluster 2.2 million light years away that's actually much, much larger than the uh, Omega Centauri star cluster, uh, globular cluster that we see from Earth. But it's kind of a remarkable thing when you think about it. And I'm just fascinated by things like that. If we go on to M33, which theoretically is a naked eye object, but it's still really hard to see. It's a very low surface brightness object. Um, I don't know if I've actually seen that. I think I have from Potter County, but I'm not, I, I think I might have a, an inverted imagination on that one. I'm not really sure. But there are also structures within M33 that you can pick out with even a six inch telescope. One of the most prominent structures within is this one, which is NGC 604. And NGC 604 is what's called an H2 cloud. So I'm sure that everybody who is a physics teacher or professor knows what we mean by H2. But if you think of a hydrogen atom, you know, there's a nucleus there that's a proton and there's an electron, single electron. And this is an H2 region, which means that it's a singly ionized hydrogen atom. That simply means that the electron has been bumped off. And in the course of bumping off, it emits a photon, and in the course of reuniting with its nucleus or another nucleus, it emits another photon of light at a particular wavelength. So these H2 regions glow with kind of a pinkish light. And this is a Hubble wide field view of that object. Now you can see this easily, this object, and a few of the others with relatively small telescopes, Earth-based telescopes. Here's 604 down here. And you can pick out a number. Here's another pink one over here. And of course, the larger the telescope and the better the night and the higher in the sky M33 is, the more likely you are to be able to see not just some of the spiral structure, uh, but you can see some of these H2 regions, as well as some of the more prominent star clusters within the arms of the galaxy. Now, to go to something that's definitely telescopic, and this is a little confusing view, but this is this is, uh, excuse me, this is Cassiopeia right over here, the little M or the W or the chair, depending on how it's branding in the sky. There's another irregular galaxy that's about 10th magnitude right there, and that's called IC10. The interesting thing about IC10 is that it's what's called a starburst galaxy. Does anybody know what a starburst galaxy is? 
It's a galaxy, you know, all galaxies, I shouldn't say all, but most galaxies that have a lot of dust and gas have star forming regions within them. A starburst galaxy has an exceptionally high rate of star formation. And NGC, uh, I, IC10 rather, that stands for index catalog, by the way. That's an addendum to the new general catalog by Dreyer. Um, IC10 is one of the most active starburst galaxies that astronomers know. And I did write down, so I would not forget, how many X-ray binary sources are in that particular galaxy. There are 10, <laughs> maybe more. And that's really significant. X-rays are produced as a result of high temperatures, which means intense activity. And there is a prodigious rate of star formation in this particular galaxy. And it means that large, large stars are being formed. And the larger the star, the greater the mass, the quicker they exhaust their, their nuclear fuels. And when they do that, they collapse catastrophically. Well, X-ray binaries are systems where there are two stars of different sizes, and these can be very massive stars, and one of them feeds off gases of another one. It sucks gases off, and those gases form an accretion disk. And when that accretion disk heats these gases up as they're falling into it, to temperatures high enough, they'll produce X-rays. But because these stars live a short life, they will collapse into one of two different things, either a neutron star, which is an extremely dense star, or a black hole, or two neutron stars, or two black holes that are still have a conservation of angular momentum, and they're spinning, spinning, spinning. Well, eventually, that orbit decays. And when they coalesce or get close enough, what do they release? What did they, what did they create? Gravitational, Gravitational waves. And that's the interesting little tie into tonight's talk, because I know we're going to be learning about gravitational waves. And you can see this galaxy through easily through a 10-inch telescope. It's in the plane of the Milky Way. It's obscured by a lot of dust and gas, but it is visible. And here's another picture of it right over here. Uh, POSS, that's the Palomar Observatory Sky Survey. This was taken with that 48-inch Schmidt camera not necessarily by Hubble, but taken out of Palomar. And here is one of the studies that I found that looks at blue super X-ray binaries, supergiant X-ray binaries in the dwarf galaxy, IC10. And there are lots of articles in the literature about this particular galaxy, if you're ever inclined to want to look them up. So what about the relative sizes of, of objects in the local group? Well, Andromeda is the biggest, followed by our own Milky Way followed by M33, followed by the Magellanic Clouds. So there's a gradation of sizes. And these are a couple of representative objects. You've got M31, it's approximately 152,000 light years across. We're a little smaller than that. M33 is a little smaller than that. And then we go down to the Magellanic Clouds and they're smaller yet. But couple of the smallest objects that still might be considered galaxies are Sege, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce this, two, and Wilman one and two. Sege stands for the Sloan Extension for Galactic Understanding and Exploration. It's part of the Sky Digital, uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey. But when you look at, oh, they have about a thousand stars each. Is that a galaxy? I don't know. I was thinking of galaxies as being much more massive. But when you look at the pictures of Wilman 1, the members of Wilman 1 are circled in green. That looks kind of like a star cluster, according to our expectation. But it's still considered a galaxy because there's a lot of mass in these things. And it could be dark matter. Don't really know. But if you think back to some of the talks that we've had here, Wilman 1 and 2 are named after an astronomer who was at Haverford. And Beth came to talk to us pre-COVID. I don't know, five years ago, six years ago, something like that. I'm not really sure. But the bottom line is that members of the local group include not just spirals, ellipticals, irregulars, spherical galaxies, dwarfs, dwarf sphericals, subdwarf spherical's, ultra-faint dwarfs, maybe even globulars, because if you look at the list, a lot of the objects that are thought to have been in the local group 
as small galaxies, spheroidal galaxies, are now thought to be globulars. And Lou Barbarisa says M82 is a good example of a starburst. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's that's another one. Good, Louis, thank you. But you can observe so many of these different objects from our home here on Earth. And one great way to do it, and this is what got me really interested, was an Astronomical League observing challenge. And this is the local galaxy group and galactic neighborhood. And there's a whole listing of objects within the local group that you can observe relatively easily from a reasonably dark site, including some of the globulars in M31. And you can get an observing certificate. And that's great. And I did a lot of these with this particular telescope, which is just a 10 inch telescope. So I would encourage you, if you want a really fun project, especially for this time of year, try this one. It's really great. And you can pick these up online at the Astronomical League website. So that's it for tonight. Thank you very much. Oh. Thank you, Lynn. That was awesome. Okay, now I need to call again on Jeremy. He's going to tell us about upcoming programs and introduce our speaker for tonight. All right, so changing my hat here, which means a double pay for tonight. <laughs> All right, so a little bit about uh, upcoming programs. Let me get out of that. So let's see, for the November meeting, we're planning on a member night. I was hoping that it was going to be about the eclipse, which I think most of us got rained out. Uh, I think anyone who was east of the Mississippi uh, saw a whole bunch of clouds or nebulae in Latin, but not the right type of nebulae. But uh, we are hoping to do that anyway. So I'll send out a message to the group to see who's uh, interested in presenting. I know a few people did get to travel out west, so hopefully we got some nice uh, pictures of that. So we'll be putting that uh, meeting together. That'll be in November. Uh, in December, as Jan said, we're we'll going to be having the uh, auction. So we'll have the live portion of that. Uh, January of 2024, we're actually going to have uh, Dr. Naoko Korohashi Nielsen from Drexel University. And she's actually a uh, pretty high ranking person on the Ice Cube uh, project, which is uh, doing neutrino astronomy. You may have seen the uh, recent uh, press conference, actually, a couple months back over the summer. And they actually made the first image where they're just starting to identify some neutrinos coming from the galaxy. So she'll be talking about that. That'll be really exciting. Uh, February of 2024, we're going to have uh, Dr. Paul Halpern. He's going to be coming back and he's going to talk about his latest book. Uh, so that's all we have uh, so far. I'll be working on uh, spring of 24 in the next uh, couple of months. If anyone has any suggestions for programs, uh, please pass them along to me. Right. At this point, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Shin Du, or Alice, as she goes and she's going to introduce this evening's invited speaker. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to introduce my colleague, Dr. Paul Baker, as our invited speaker tonight. Uh, so Dr. Dr. Uh, Paul Baker received his PhD from Montana State University in 2013. And then during his PhD work, he worked on detecting gravitational waves with LIGO. And then he, uh, he worked as a postdoc in West Virginia University. And then uh, he worked as a visiting faculty member at SUNY uh, Genesea. And then in 2019, he joined uh, the physics department at Widener University and become our colleague. Uh, since, uh, since 2016, he has been uh, a member of Nanograph and IPTA collaborations and was co-chair of the IPTA gravitational wave analysis working group from 2020 to 2023. And recently he co-authored um, a uh, couple of papers uh, about the evidence for gravitational wave background. Uh, so today we'll listen about that. Thanks. Yeah, this uh, one's probably better. You can usually swing off and alert control L for the swing. All right, did it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Put this in there. Okay. 
Yeah, probably should have done this before. Can everybody hear me? Uh, no, turn it on. Is it on? Oh. Uh, slider. Slider. Can everybody hear me now? Yeah. Excellent. Hello. Uh, I am Paul Baker. So I'm going to be talking about which way is this? This way? No, the opposite of what the thing is. It's the opposite of what you're saying. Okay. I'm going to be talking about the gravitational wave background. And I've been working with the NanoSav collaboration, and that stands for North American NanoHertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves. We sort of gave up on the acronym at the end. And then the International Pulsar Timing Array is an international body doing a similar thing. Let's see, will that go forward? There we go. Okay. So in June of this year, Nanograv reported evidence for a stochastic uh, gravitational wave background. And this is our figure of merit, I guess. By the end of the talk, I hope you understand at least some of what's going on here. I'm going to assume that people here don't know much about gravitational waves, don't know much about uh, supermassive black holes or radio pulsars, and we'll talk about this. So what is the black dashed line here is a theoretical prediction for a correlation pattern between different uh, pulsars, and then the blue things are the observed data. We'll get back to this at the very end. But before we get into that, I want to talk about general relativity and gravitational waves. So according to general relativity, gravity is not a force. It is all about the shape of space-time. So this is a pretty common cartoon about how to think about general relativity. So the sun is really massive. It warps the space-time around it, so it makes this dent in the fabric of space-time. And the Earth is less massive, but it makes a little dent over there, and the Earth sort of rolls around in the gravitational dent of the sun. And maybe a better but much harder way to think about it is something like this, because space is three-dimensional, so you have to think about how if we were to try to measure the distance uh, if in like a grid of things, if the Earth wasn't here, then everything would be nice and evenly gridded, but the gravitational field of the Earth squishes things a little bit. So if I tried to measure a distance from here to here or from there to there, uh, in the original grid, they would have been equal, but now they are not because of the disturbance of the Earth. So that's sort of how general relativity thinks about gravity, and it's been around for a while, so it's made some predictions that have held up over time. So one thing is that the trajectories in space-time follow the shape of space. So everything tries to go in a straight line, but you follow the curvature of the space and you travel along that path. So if you wanted to fly from Washington to Tokyo, you might wonder why you didn't just go from here to there. That seems like a better plan, but this map of the Earth is a sort of squished picture of the actual globe. So if you want to go from Washington to Tokyo, you would end up following a great circle, which is a geodesic. That's the shortest distance between two places on a sphere. So if we look at the globe and rotate it, so we're looking straight down at the North Pole, now you can see that the trip from Washington to Tokyo along this path is a lot more reasonable than trying to go out across California and wrapping through the Pacific to Tokyo as before. So that is our trajectories should follow the shape of space. So since the Earth is curved, we're going to follow a curved path to get from one place to another. Uh, light also follows curved paths. So this headline over here is from the New York Times on November 10th, 1919, after uh, the Eddington Eclipse Expedition. And it says, lights all askew in the heavens. Uh, stars not where they seemed or were calculated to be, but nobody need worry. Uh, they just appeared to be different places. So uh, the star is over here. That's where we expect it to be. But when we look from the Earth, it appears to be over there because as the light passes by the sun, it changes its direction due to the curving of the space-time near the sun. So in Newtonian gravity, since light doesn't have mass, you wouldn't expect light to do anything in a gravitational field. But general relativity says it should follow a curved path just like anything else. And this is used... Uh, in astronomy often. So these are all pictures of what are called Einstein ringed lab gravitational lenses. So all of the yellow things are colored images of a galaxy in the foreground and all the blue stuff is a galaxy that is behind it. And so as the light from that galaxy 
comes forward, it goes out both sides of the front galaxy, bends and comes back in. And so it looks like that light is making a ring around the foreground galaxy, even though it's coming from behind it. So some of these are nice and symmetrical, others are not so symmetrical, and it all has to do with the distribution of mass and the geometric alignment of things. So like this might be a very nice lens, and this is a beat up scratched lens, and this is a really smudgy lens that you know it has a chip in it. Uh, another prediction is that the orbits you get in general relativity are different than what you'd expect from Kepler's laws and Newtonian gravity. So famously, the perihelion of a uh, elliptical orbit advances. So in Newtonian gravity, an elliptical orbit would just go around in the same ellipse over and over and over again if nothing was disturbing it. Uh, and famously, Mercury's perihelion processes a little bit faster than you would expect just from the other stuff in the solar system. So things like Jupiter and the Earth pull on Mercury, which cause its orbit to not be a perfect ellipse and process a little bit. Uh, and even in the 1800s, people had noticed that accounting for all the planets in the solar system, it still wasn't accounting for enough of this perihelion advance. And the modification to gravity fixed that just right. So you would get exactly the right perihelion advance thanks to general relativity. Another fun thing from general relativity, light loses energy when it travels away from massive things. So this little cartoon is meant to be like a gravitational well. So there's a very massive thing down here warping the space around it. And if I were to throw a ball up, it would lose energy and slow down. But with light, if I throw light up, it loses energy, but it can't slow down. And so instead of slowing down, it changes its frequency. So it loses energy and goes from yellow light to red light as it goes up. And if I throw light down in towards the mass, it gains energy and it can't speed up. And so it raises its frequency and blue shifts. So this is called uh, the gravitational red shift as you go up that way. Uh, and that's another prediction of general relativity. And my favorite prediction of general relativity is that Gravitational waves can be generated by accelerating masses with a little asterisk if you want to pay close attention to the complicated math of it. But the idea is pretty much anything that's not perfectly symmetric and accelerating is going to be radiating energy away in gravitational waves. So something like a binary system, we have these two objects orbiting a common center of mass, and they are both constantly accelerating as they go around the circle. And so they're going to be constantly emitting gravitational waves. So they'll lose energy and that's gonna change their orbit as that happens. So I am interested in detecting gravitational waves like this. So what gravitational waves do is they are ripples in the fabric of space itself. And so if I try to measure a distance in space while a gravitational wave is there, it's going to change the apparent distance between freely floating things. So if I have a ring of particles as a gravitational wave passes by, say, coming straight out of the board at you, uh, it would squeeze the space in one direction while stretching it in the other direction. So you do something kind of like this, where things get squished one way and stretched the other way and back and forth. And there are two polarizations of gravitational waves predicted by general relativity, just like with light. This one is known as the plus polarization, and they call this one the cross polarization for reasons that might be apparent if you stare at that for a minute. Uh, but they are basically the same thing, just rotated at 45 degrees compared to each other. So if I want to detect a gravitational wave, what I need to do is measure the distance between freely floating things. And if that distance changes, then maybe that was a gravitational wave changing that distance. Uh, gravitational waves were first indirectly detected, you could say, using a binary pulsar system. So the Holst-Taylor binary, which is this phone number, uh, PSRJ 1915 plus 1606, is a, a radio pulsar. Uh, in a binary system with another neutron star. So a pulsar is itself a neutron star, and the binary companion is a second neutron star, and the binary period of this system is around eight hours. So it is pretty fast. You have two stars, each a little bit more massive than the sun, orbiting each other every eight-ish hours. So that's a pretty wild system, and the effects of relativity are pretty apparent in something that's that big moving that fast. 
And what this plot is showing is the orbital decay of the system due to emitting gravitational waves. So the binary period changes by about 75 microseconds per year, which doesn't seem like very much, uh, but you can measure pulsars very well. And so this was first reported in the 1980s up here. And this plot is from a more recent paper in 2004. But this line through these data points is not like a best fit. It is a prediction based upon only this last point. So you basically measure the properties of the system here and then integrate back in time as to what it used to be doing. And it hits all the points as it goes back to when you start. Uh, so that is the energy loss due to the system uh, emitting gravitational waves. About eight years ago, LIGO detected the first gravitational waves directly. You may have seen this figure before. And so uh, these two detectors, one in Washington state, the other in Louisiana, each detected this little squiggle by measuring the distance between two mirrors uh, very, 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 very carefully. Uh, this also, if you look at the time scale here, we're talking about a fraction of a second. Uh, and the frequency starts out slow, and that speeds up and speeds up until the merger happens, and then it sort of settles down. So here again, the frequency, this is a plot of frequency versus time. It starts out low frequency and chirps up to a higher frequency when they merge. So what we're seeing is the two, is two black holes in a binary orbiting each other, and they get closer together and speed up and speed up until they get so close together that they collide, and then merge into one bigger black hole. And Paul, well, didn't they detect that event shortly after they turned it on? Yes, this was detected weeks after it turned on in 2015. Uh, and they have now detected more than 100 binary black hole systems since then. So the first couple years, only a few. And as they improve the detector, the, the volume, the like distance you can see out gets a little bit bigger each time. Uh, and actually, so if you think about this, when you a gravitational wave detector is more like an ear, it sort of sees, hears all directions at the same time. And so if you increase the distance by a little bit, you increase the volume you can see by a whole lot. So if you double the distance you can see, you can see eight times more volume. So as it improves, you get more and more and more space to listen to. And so the, the numbers grew very rapidly once they started making improvements. So these are the first handful of gravitational waves LIGO detected. All of these are from what do we call stellar mass compact binaries. So all of them have masses on the order of regular stars. So the first ones, each black hole had a mass of about 30 solar masses. So bigger than the sun, but not crazy. Uh, down here, GW170817 is a binary neutron star system, so each object had a mass of about one solar mass, more like 1.4, uh, but uh, all stellar mass things. So they all have the same kind of shape. They all start out lower frequency and chirp up to higher frequency and come to higher amplitude, and then when they hit, they flatten down to nothing. Um, they all merge at different frequencies. So like this merger happens at a lower frequency than this one, which is oscillating so fast you can't see it anymore. And that has to do with the mass of the object. So the bigger black holes move slower and they collide earlier because they're bigger, uh, whereas the smaller things can get closer together and move faster before they actually collide. But these are all stellar mass compact binaries. So if we think of the spectrum of gravitational waves, just like the spectrum of light, over here at 100 hertz, 10 to the 2 is 100 hertz, this is where LIGO sees things. So on this graph, the black line is called a sensitivity curve, and anything with a strain bigger than that, that instrument could detect, and anything with a strain smaller than that is too quiet for it to hear. Uh, so this is what LIGO sees in the order of a few hertz up to maybe a thousand hertz. A proposed space-based mission called LISA, the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, is like LIGO in space. Uh, it sees things in the millihertz, 10 to the minus 3 hertz kind of range, so maybe 0.1 millihertz up to 10 or 100 millihertz. And what I want to talk about is nanohertz. 
So a nanohertz is 10 to the minus nine hertz. That's way over here. So one nanohertz, 10 to the minus eight is 10 nanohertz. And that is what a pulsar timing array could be sensitive to. So one nanohertz in frequency is a period of one per 30 years. So these are oscillation periods on years long time scale. So LIGO measures gravitational waves by measuring the distance between two mirrors. So you send a laser down, there's a beam splitter, the laser bounces around between these mirrors, and you can read out an interference pattern to try to precisely measure that distance. What a pulsar timing array does is it tries to measure the distance between the solar system and radio pulsars out in the galaxy. So our detector is really the solar system and the pulsars. Our detector spans not quite the size of the galaxy, but like half the size of the galaxy. We don't really observe any pulsars over there. Um, but one problem with that, right, if LIGO is doing something funny down here, you can like walk four kilometers or hop in a little electric truck and drive four kilometers to the end and open it up and bring your wrenches and pull around in there. But if one of our pulsars does something funny, we can't really hop in an electric truck and drive you know, 10,000 light years out to the pulsar to see what the heck is going on. So there are some challenges with using a star as part of your detector. But the basic idea is there's going to be gravitational waves coming through our galaxy, and we're going to use these radio pulsars as like the end station mirrors in LIGO. We're going to measure the distance, sort of, between the pulsar and the Earth. What matters for gravitational waves isn't the absolute distance, it's the change in distance. It, you measure the change in distance. And so even if we don't really precisely know how far away a pulsar is, if we can, if we can see it change, get a little closer, get a little further away, we can monitor that change in distance and uh, detect gravitational waves. So one thing, we are using millisecond radio pulsars. Those are pulsars that have rotation periods in the millisecond time scales. So we'll talk about that in a second. So what is a pulsar? A pulsar is a neutron star whose magnetic field is misaligned from its rotation axis. And what that means is that the magnetic field, as it spins around, is going to be beaming radio waves out of it. And so it makes kind of a lighthouse effect. So as this field spins around and shoots radio waves, when it's pointed towards us, we see a burst of radio waves, a pulse. And when it's pointed away from us, we see nothing. And if this rotation is stable, if we know how fast this thing is rotating and how it might be changing, then if we see one pulse, we should be able to predict exactly when the next one should come. So if... Uh, this, so the point is that we want these pulsars to be incredibly stable. You need to know exactly when the pulses come and when to expect all of the next ones to come. I think I need to click on something to play this particular animation. Can I, I don't know, is there a mouse yeah. up there? Yeah. Let's see it. Okay, well, <laughs> what should happen? <laughs> All right, so this pulsar is emitting gravitational, or this, this pulsar is emitting pulses. So each of these little bumps is a pulse coming from the pulsar. And if we assume that the Earth stays in the same place, and as a gravitational wave passes through, don't worry about it. <laughs> it it's fine. <laughs> so as the gravitational wave passes through, the space between the Earth and the pulsar will change. It might stretch a little farther or it'll squish a little closer. And so that effectively makes the pulsar look like it's moving away from us or moving towards us. And so if we measure the time it takes for one pulse to get there, while the pulsar is close to us, those pulses will take less time to get to us. So those will arrive a little earlier than we expect. And when the space time is stretched apart, the pulsar is over here. And then those pulses will take a little longer to get to us. So those will come a little later than we expect. And we can sort of think of it from the perspective of the Earth as some of the pulses are further apart in time, then they get closer together in time, then they get further apart in time. So by monitoring 
the time of arrival of these pulses, we can look for variations in the space time between us and the pulsar. This is a little more complicated than that because the Earth is moving and the pulsar is moving. And so we need to account for all of that. We need to know very precisely how the Earth moves around the center of mass of the solar system. If this pulsar has a binary companion, we need to know very precisely the orbit of that pulsar and its companion. Yeah. So clearly the pulses spread out and, and have different timing, but does the the pulse itself vary too? So from, from zero to lot to zero happen differently? Yeah, so there is some variation in that. Um, one kind of weird thing about pulses, I don't have this picture, but there's a an 80s post-punk band. <laughs> um, the, the album's called, oh man, why am I blanking on this? Uh, Unnamed Pleasures is the name of the album. <laughs> oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The album cover is data from a pulsar that shows all the little wiggles and they're all, it's flat and there's some bumpy stuff and it's flat and it's flat and there's some bumpy stuff. It's a, It kind of looks like a waterfall and each one is a little bit different, but they happen very often. So a millisecond pulsar is emitting hundreds of pulses a second. And when you average the pulse over hundreds or thousands of pulses, it looks basically the same. So all pulses are a pulse. Yeah, all pulses are a little different, but when you average over a thousand pulses, you get almost exactly the same thing. And so we, we use that. We average over thousands of pulses at a time. This is going to kill me that I can't think. <laughs> joy division. Joy division. Yes, yes. New order came after joy division. Same thing. All right. Um, so our detector really is the pulsars, right? We're using the pulsars as part of our instrument, just like LIGO uses the mirrors. So one end of our instrument is the center of mass of the solar system. Uh, so we have a, a sort of pseudo inertial reference frame for people who are into that sort of thing. And then the other end of our detector are all of these pulsars floating out in the galaxy. All right, so what do our data actually look like? Well, we use radio telescopes to observe our pulsars. So we have used Arecibo, which is a, or was uh, a 300 meter radio dish in Puerto Rico. We use the Green Bank Telescope, which is a 100 meter radio dish in Green Bank, West Virginia. And more recently, we've been using the Very Large Array, which is an array of smaller dishes. I think each one's 20 or 30 meters in Socorro, New Mexico. Uh, these are very big. <laughs> so it's hard to fathom like what a hundred meter diameter radio dish is like, but see down here, these are like trailers, like house trailers sized things down here next to the radio dish. And this whole thing spins, there's a circular track. So you can spin it all the way around and you can tip it up and down to look at uh, different places. Arecibo just sat there and you would aim the little receiver cabin up here in order to get, you know, if radio waves came down here, they would bounce over there and come up. And if they came from over here, they would bounce over there and go. Uh, so Arecibo collapsed a few years ago, so we sadly can no longer use Arecibo, but we have tons and tons of data from it uh, in our set. Our most recent data set has 15 years of observation. So I said these waves have year-long period, so we need to be observing them for years to notice the changes over years. So this is in equatorial coordinates, and each point is showing one of the pulsars that we monitor. There are 68 of them in this data release. We monitor more than 70 total. Uh, and the different symbols tell you which telescope it's observed by. So a couple of them right, are observed by both by two telescopes, and that's a good calibration thing to do. Um, Arecibo couldn't move, so it could really only see from around zero up to about 35 degrees in uh, declination, whereas the GBT can tilt, so it can see all the way up to the North Pole, and then it can see as far south as its uh, latitude on the Earth lets you, so it can't see the far southern sky, but it could see down to close to negative 45. The VLA is further south than New Mexico, and so you could see what this one thing that no one else could see. Although telescopes in the Southern Hemisphere can see that pretty easily. Um, but they're all sort of spread out. The galactic plane ends up making kind of a U-shaped in these coordinates. 
So a lot of the pulsars are in the galactic plane, but not all of them. The galactic center is over here. So if you look, there's more stuff in the galaxy when you look towards the center. Uh, and so uh, it's easier to find pulsars over there. Each of these little points represents an observation of a pulsar. So each line is one pulsar's observations. The colors are different radio frequency bands. And then the boxes show how our data set has evolved in time. So we started out back in 2013, releasing five years of data, which was actually collected up until about 2010. And you'll notice that not all the pulsars were here yet. So we keep discovering new pulsars and adding them to our array. So some of these pulsars were discovered. These are the first discovery observations that get added to our array. Uh, so some, a few of these we have a solid 15 years of data on, and some of these over here, we really only have a couple years of data. But each little point is one observation of one of those pulsars. So remember, our key data product is the difference between the time of arrival and when we expected the pulse to come. So we're going to measure the time of arrival of the pulse. So each of these points is like us measuring when the pulse got there. And then we're going to compare that to the model of when they should get there. And the difference is called the timing residual, right? So if the pulse is right on time, this should be zero. If the pulse is early, uh, then this should be negative. And if it's late, this should be positive. So this is a picture of one of our pulsars data, J1909-3744 is its phone number in equatorial coordinates. Um, it is kind of the golden boy, it's our best pulsar. Uh, so back, back in the day, we had pretty spotty observations of everything and we got more consistent going into the future. Uh, but what you're seeing is in the middle, let's focus on that. So this is all the times of arrivals residual in microseconds. So it looks pretty zero on average. If we just sort of stare at this, there's a whole bunch of fuzz, but on average, it all looks kind of like zero. There's deviations on the scale of tens of microseconds. Down here is a daily average. So we take all of the pulses in one day and average them into a single data point, and you get something that looks like this. And so underneath all of this fuzz is sort of a wiggle. So for a couple of years here, all the pulses were late by like half a microsecond, 500 nanoseconds. And over here, all the pulses are early by, on average, half of a microsecond. So it's a tiny, tiny effect. And with the LIGO data, you could just like see a gravitational wave in the data. And this is even sketchy <laughs> to do with our data because it is so fuzzy and these are so quiet. So here's four pulsars. There's 1909 again. Uh, all of these are put on the same Y axis. So you can see the fuzz here is a lot less than the fuzz in the others. And if I do my daily averaging, I get the little wiggle. If I do a daily average of this, there's, I don't know, is that a wiggle? It's kind of a wiggle. Uh, over here, maybe that's a wiggle, I don't know. Over here, most of our pulsars really look like this, to be perfectly honest. Uh, so this one was discovered in 2012, so we don't have a full 15 years of data. Even on the daily average, it looks kind of like nonsense. But the thing is, is that we have 68 of these things. And so when we are correlating one to the next, 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 this builds up the signal over time. And so that's how we can detect this incredibly tiny effect in our data. So what causes our gravitational waves? Well, it is supermassive black holes. So the universe has lots of galaxies, as we heard about earlier. And those galaxies interact with each other gravitationally, like we do with the other galaxies in our local group. And if you wait long enough, those galaxies get closer together and will merge into a bigger galaxy. So here's two galaxies. This is a picture from Hubble. I don't have an image credit over here. Uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope showing two galaxies mid-merger, right? It's going to be a long time, whoops, before they actually get together and form a single galaxy, but the, here are two galaxies actually merging. So once they merge into a bigger galaxy, if each galaxy had a supermassive black hole at its center, 
like our galaxy does, and like most galaxies seem to, then there will now be two supermassive black holes in this new bigger galaxy. And over the course of millions of years, they will migrate to the set the common center of the new galaxy and form a binary. So there will be two black holes. Each one could have a mass of billions of times the mass of the sun orbiting each other. And as they get closer and closer together, the orbit goes faster and faster. And fast might mean you know, orbiting once every 100 years or once every 30 years, that would be a nanohertz or once every 10 years. Uh, but these are very, very big things. And so even though they're not moving fast uh, by, you know, a LIGO kind of time scale, they're still stirring up the space time around them pretty dramatically because they're so massive. So a single supermassive binary produces that characteristic LIGO signal. So it starts out lower frequency and it chirps to a higher frequency and it merges and it settles down to a single black hole. So the binaries that we're going to be looking at are actually millions of years, mega years in our SI prefixes, mega years from merging. Uh, and so they're going to be way over there on this graph. Right? There's going to be oscillations way, way, way over there. So when these uh, black holes actually merge, their orbital periods are going to be on the kind of weeks to days time scale over here. And where we're seeing them is years time scales, you know, millions of years before they've merged. So it's going to be a while before we get these big bursts of gravitational waves from the merger, but we can see the wiggle of the orbit. So if there were a single nearby supermassive binary, it would cause a wiggle in our deck. And so this picture is showing sort of three simulated pulsars and the timing residual sort of wiggling around due to those binaries. This is days. I should have changed this time scale. Astronomers like a day. This is a uh, medium Julian day. Um, but yeah, so... 300, 400 is a year, right? So 1,000 is a few years. And so these are slow oscillations. So you can see the green pulsar, right? Its, its points are measured very well. We're measuring the time of arrival of the green pulsar pretty well in this simulation, and we can see the wiggle. The blue pulsar, we don't really measure the time of arrival super precisely. And if you just saw the blue data, you wouldn't necessarily think you saw anything. Over here is a Fourier transform of these data. Uh, and so we're looking at a frequency picture. So some of you might know what that is. So uh, you can see a peak. All three of these pulsars have a peak at the same frequency, which is the orbital frequency to a factor of two to the binary. In the blue one, its noise level is way up here at the same level as the signal, whereas the green one, its sort of noise level is way down here, well below the signal. So if I have a whole bunch of these binaries, each one makes a gravitational wave, right? There's not just two galaxies merging in the universe. There are lots and lots of galaxies. Lots of them are mid-merger. Lots of them have binary supermassive black holes. And so it's not just one gravitational wave signal. It's a whole lot of them. So there might be a, a loud, slow, nearby one. There might be a faster one that's a little bit further away. They're all coming from different directions. And when I add up the gravitational waves filling our galaxy, I might get something that looks like this. It doesn't look like a nice single wiggle. It looks kind of like noise, just this slow varying process. And so if I want to detect a stochastic background of gravitational waves, I'm trying to hear all of those merging black holes at the same time. It's the sum of every uh, galaxy with a binary supermassive black hole system in our general neighborhood. So I don't know the distance. I should have looked at this up in light years. It's about out to redshift two that we can see. So every single galaxy that has a binary out to redshift two would be making gravitational waves, if it is, that we could see adding to this hiss of sound in our uh, galaxy. So how do we detect that sort of noise and know that it's actually gravitational waves and not something else? Well, one thing 
is that if th these gravitational waves are coming from supermassive black holes, we have theories about how black holes work and how galaxies work, and we can predict the spectral shape of this signal. So uh, this orange line is trying to represent the spectrum expected from a gravitational wave background produced by an ensemble of supermassive black hole binaries. So lots of supermassive black hole binaries all added together. It's a little bit higher power at lower frequency, and it decays away to a lower power at higher frequency. And this slope is predicted. And so we can try to measure the slope of our spectrum and see if it matches. So in reality, we won't get a perfectly straight line. We'll get sort of a realization that sort of squiggles around the ball. If I take this spectrum in the frequency space and Fourier transform it into the time domain, it would look something like this. So it's dominated by the lowest frequencies, the longest periods. So there's like one big slow oscillation for the longest periods. And then there's some lower amplitude wiggles from the higher frequencies, the shorter periods. Everybody still on board? <laughs> yeah. All right, so that's one way we, we can do this. The next thing is that the gravitational wave signal is gonna be correlated in the different pulsars. So if you think about a pulsar there and a pulsar there, if a single gravitational wave comes by, it's going to squish the space for both of them and then stretch the space for both of them. So that one gravitational wave is going to make a correlated signal between those two. If they're at 90 degrees to each other, right, that single gravitational wave will squish the space for one and stretch it for the other and then do the reverse. So those are going to be anti-correlated. And what we see is for pulsars whose separation on the sky is about zero degrees, they should be correlated positively with a factor of a half. And around 90 degrees, they are anti-correlated with a factor of about 0.1. And so right that was for one gravitational wave. It's complicated because there's gravitational waves coming from all directions adding together. You have to do this big, huge average over the whole universe. And that sort of washes out that nice, pretty picture in our heads. But the basic idea is the same, right? Things near each other should be positively correlated. Things 90 degrees should be negatively correlated. If they're on opposite ends, they're still positively correlated, right? They're closer together and spread out. So that's back at 180 degrees. So I could take two pulsars, like this one and that one, and they are separated by, I don't know, what do we, what do we think that is? <laughs> Uh, 30 degrees. If so I go to 30 degrees, I measure the correlation between those two pulsars. I measure it. I put a point on this plot. All right. Next, let's take these two pulsars. What are they separated by? Maybe 10 degrees. We measure the correlation. We put a point on the plot. What about this one and that one? It looks like a lot, but it actually wraps around. So maybe that's also 15 degrees. That's over here. What about this one and that one? That's 90 degrees. Put it there. We do this for every possible pair up there, and we get a plot with like a thousand of little points on it, and the average should look like that little curve. So that's what we're trying to do. So if we measure this particular correlation pattern, this is called the Hellings and Downs curve, and that is the correlation pattern you get from a stochastic background of gravitational waves, as opposed to something else. Like let's say all of our clocks were wrong, Right, so our clocks on Earth kind of wiggled around. So all the pulses would look like they were a little bit late because our clocks were wrong. And then all the pulses would look like they're a little early because the clocks were wrong. And in that case, all of the pulsars would be positively correlated, right? They all do the same thing. That's a different correlation pattern than this one. So we wanna measure this correlation pattern and tell it apart from other correlation patterns. So our actual results, we made it. You now know how gravitational waves work. You know what a gravitational wave background is. We can go back to some of those pictures. So this is all from a paper uh, that is in the Astrophysical Journal Letters. And let's look at it. So here's our plot from the beginning. So we reported our evidence for the gravitational wave background. And this was our big old figure of merit. We had 68 pulsars. If you count up all of the pairs you can make, you get 2,278 pairs just by counting up all the possible pairs of pulsars. 
So the real version of this plot has 22,000 points on it. And this is sort of a summary, right? We, we collect all of the points that lived in here and we average them and get the average and the standard deviation. Then we count off all of the pairs that live in here and we average them and get the standard deviation. So we're summarizing uh, these 22,000 points into these 15 points. So for visualization only, the actual data analysis uses the real live points. So this helps us visualize what we're seeing. Um, and you can see, so that clock error is called a monopolar correlation, and that would have a correlation of one everywhere. So that's definitely not what we're seeing. Uh, there's another type of correlation pattern called a dipolar correlation, uh, which goes from a half and then it goes down over to a half. And you would see that if like we didn't know where the center of mass of the solar system was. So if like say, Say there was some big, huge planet way out far yanking on the center of mass of the solar system. So our inertial reference frame that's at the center of mass of the solar system is at the wrong place, right? We think it's here, but it's really there. That would cause a dipolar correlation in the data. And so that would start at a half and go down to a half. So our, our points would also exclude that type of error. The Hellings and Downs curve is a quadrupolar correlation pattern. And if you're into uh, general relativity, quadrupoles are very important in general relativity. That's why you get this quadrupolar pattern out of uh, gravitational wave pattern. So over here, uh, for people into statistics, uh, we are comparing this Hellings and Downs correlation to a common signal that's in all the pulsars but is uncorrelated. So you could imagine there's just some weird noise that affects all the pulsars. It's not correlated. And so our statistical significance comparing Hellings and Downs correlations to non-correlations is in Gaussian equivalent, something like three and a half to four sigma. What's important, I should have put up a slide of this, is that if you compare our data and think, let's assume all the pulsars are totally independent, right? They're all just doing their own thing. Uh, and compare that to all of them have a common noise source with the same spectrum, the statistical significance of that individual noise to common noise, common uncorrelated noise, is about uh, 10 to the 12 to 1 betting odds, which I don't know how many sigma that is, but that's like one in a quadrillion chance. And so we we're 100% sure there is a common signal affecting all of the pulsars, and we're really sure that it is from a gravitational wave background. So in particle physics, people like five sigma as a detection. In psychology, people like two sigma as a detection. So we're somewhere in the middle, um, but this is, this is the significance we get. It's been slowly growing with time. And I think that is also reason to believe it, uh, that we expect this to keep growing as we wait for more time. So what did we actually measure? Remember, the background is supposed to have a particular shape. And so each of these gray violins is a measurement of the power in the sort of excess timing delay. So 10 to the minus six is a microsecond. Down here would be a nanosecond, 10 to the minus nine. In frequency, the next plot has a better scale. Uh, but so we measure a timing delay here and here and here and here, and it sort of washes out into the noise where we don't really measure a distinct timing delay at high frequency. So the blue is our best fit power law with some uncertainty, and that goes through, right, we're really sort of measuring these frequency bins and we're not measuring those ones too well. The dashed black line is the median power law amplitude assuming the spectral slope predicted by uh, an ensemble of supermassive black holes. So this is, we consider this kind of in mild tension with our expectations. But if you look at where we're doing the best measurements, it is agreeing pretty well. And we have reason to believe that this prediction is too strict. And I can talk about that later if people are interested in the details of that type of thing. So we are getting a power law. It does kind of match the prediction, not perfectly, but reasonably. Um, it's kind of interesting, there's excess power down here, which is sort of interesting to us, and there's maybe missing power over here, which is also kind of interesting for astrophysical reasons. 
So NanoGrav is a member of the International Pulsar Timing Array Collaboration, and we have buddies all over the world. So there's a group in Europe, the European Pulsar Timing Array. There's a group in India, the Indian Pulsar Timing Array, and they combined their data and wrote a paper that came out the same day as ours did. There's a group in Australia, the Parks Pulsar Timing Array. They use the Parks Radio Observatory, and they did the same thing. They published their data. And so if we were to put that same violin plot all together, right, so the gray violins, each of these little blobs is a violin, the orange ones are the nanograv ones, so there's our lowest frequency, our next, our next, all the way down. You get, you can see the frequencies easier to read here, one nanohertz, 10 nanohertz, um, but they all have that same spectral slope. Right, so everybody agrees with everybody else. We all have independent data sets with independent telescopes. We share some of the same pulsars. So we might look at one pulsar and the Europeans might also look at that pulsar, but we do it at different days with different telescopes. And we're seeing this same spectrum in all of them, which is neat. So the future of this is going to be the International Pulsar Timing Array. So this is the Parks Observatory in Australia. Uh, this is Effelsberg in Germany. This is Lovell in the UK, Chime in Canada, the giant meter wave radio telescope in India, and Meerkat, which is the square kilometer array pathfinder kind of thing in South Africa. So everybody is getting all their data and putting it all together into one common data set, which will give us more power to correlate more pairs of pulsars and hopefully improve our statistics. So that is the project we are all working on right now. And if we wanna make our detector better, there are a couple of things we can do. Um, the signal to noise ratio is our statistic we're gonna think about, and it's proportional to the number of pulsars uh, the observing time square rooted, and the timing uncertainty to some weird power. So we can wait, right? We can just keep timing pulsars and our signal to noise will get better. We can discover new pulsars and add them to our array. That's why we keep looking for pulsars, why our data set kept growing, adding more and more pulsars. And when we add in our buddy's pulsars, we will end up with 115 unique pulsars in our data set. So that's very exciting to me. Uh, and then timing uncertainty, we can have better radio telescopes, right? We can observe each pulse better and we can beat down the timing uncertainty in order to get a better signal to noise ratio. So that's our plan, better radio telescopes, wait and get more pulsars. So Nanogram is a big team. This is a tiny subset of our team. We have more than a hundred members. This was from a meeting in 2022. Uh, the International Pulsar Timing Array is an even bigger team. There's more people here, different sort of scale. It's hard to, there's a lot of people back there whose faces are hiding. There's me. I was in the previous picture too. I don't know if anybody spotted me, uh, but that was this past summer. And if you want to read about this, we wrote way too many papers. And so knock yourselves out and I will happily take some questions. Thanks. <laughs> All right, questions and over here. I, I'm going to grossly simplify. I'm going to grossly simplify in an effort to make sure I understand what you're doing. Yes. Because I think you're crazy. So <laughs> you point your telescope at a pulsar, uh -huh. you get a pulse. We wait, get. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. Let me explain okay. what I'm thinking. You get another a second pulse, mm -hmm. and based on the arrival time of the second pulse, you're deciding whether a pulse 30 years later is early or late. So oversimplified. But that, that pretty much it's no. So we we have a coherent like timing model that contains all of the pulses. Sure, you're and we're yeah yeah. yeah. So, so you could you could think years ago, you're deciding no, we're using data from 30 years, from 15 years ago up to yesterday to decide if the pulse today is on time or not. <laughs> yeah, and it's, I mean, it is, it is, it is kind of crazy that 
you can get that kind of timing precision. So we can time the pulsars with an accuracy of like a couple of them, 50 nanoseconds. So we know when those pulses get to the center of mass of the solar system within 50 nanoseconds of when they got there. And that's pretty nuts. So he was going to simplify. I'm just to be naive. 68 seems like low number. Uh -huh. I mean, I mean, is is it so hard to find candidates? Or is it they have to be very special? So, so there are lots of pulsars, and they all have different rotational periods. So there are there's sort of two families. One is the canonical pulsars, and they have rotational periods that are more like one second. And then we have millisecond pulsars that their rotation period is like a few milliseconds. So the faster ones are way more stable. And so in order to do the crazy thing of predicting when the next pulse comes, we need to have an incredibly stable rotator so we know exactly what it's doing. So, right, they don't spin perfectly, right? They have, they're sending off radio waves and losing energy. So there's like magnetic braking slowing them down. And depending upon how complicated their magnetic fields are, that could be more or less. And so the fast ones are way more stable. And so we only use the most stable millisecond pulsars. So we discover lots of pulsars and only some of them get added Got to it. the array. Yeah, But we've been adding about four good millisecond pulsars a year for a while, for like 10 years now. <laughs> it's just crazy. Yeah. We're going to run out eventually, but we keep getting better at finding them. It's, I, <laughs> yeah. Huh? Yeah, so we do a lot of statistics with various correlation patterns. And so one of the, if you imagine just like knocking this whole black thing up by like, you know, point one, you might say, yeah, that probably fits better. Um, and it is, it's like statistically indistinguishable. So that would be a mixture of this quadrupolar correlation plus a monopole uh, on top of that. And so general relativity predicts no monopole, no dipole, and then quadrupole and octopoles and decisexapoles and whatever the next one up is, right? So we, we try to measure the um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like a Legendre polynomial decomposition and we measure the coefficients. And you're right that that monopolar one is like not quite zero, but it's not that different than zero. So, right, I think again, in order to like really nail this down, we would wanna shrink all these error bars, right? The reason why we're three and a half to four sigma and not five or six sigma is because these error bars are too big. So that's the getting more pairs, right? Shrinks down the error bars basically. people don't do research on nanohertz electromagnetic waves huh? <laughs> because say not much happens at that rate. Mm -hmm. um, if you had your rotating black holes, if they pick up speed, frequency goes up, but does the amplitude of the wave go up? Is there an inductive type effect in gravity? Like yeah, so um if we think about it in terms of like the acceleration, right? When you're going faster around the same circle, your acceleration went up. And so you would then be radiating more. So your amplitude does go up. That's why you get that, that chirping. If I go way back to the beginning to like the, actually to this, right? So the amplitude increases as you get close to the merger as the frequency goes up. Uh, I apologize in advance for this question, but I'm not a scientist, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> so I guess the question is, what's the point of this? I mean, what is this going to tell us in relation to what? Yeah, so it is sort of like, if you think of the cosmic microwave background, Right when when it was first discovered, it was just kind of a hiss at a particular microwave frequency. You point your microwave telescope at different places on the sky, you get the same thing. 
you know, what's that? It's noise. And then as you start to measure it better and better, you can learn about the early universe by looking at variations in that. So our stochastic background from supermassive binaries, right, it's the sum of all of the supermassive black holes in our general neighborhood out to like gigaparsecs away. So that's billions of light years away. Um, where's the slide I'm looking for? That kind of does. Yeah, so you can learn about that population on average. So like you could learn about the rate that galaxies merge. You could learn about the average size of black holes. You can actually learn about their environments. So this black line is assuming only gravitational waves are taking energy away from the system. If there's like extra stars and gas and galaxy centers, then that will interact with the black holes and remove energy. And that has the effect of sort of truncating the spectrum at low frequencies. So you get something that's sort of flat and then falls over. And so measuring like that turnover would actually tell us a lot about the average environments at the centers of galaxies, which might not seem that exciting to you, but we learn a lot about the entire history of galactic mergers in this one signal. And the better we characterize it, so right now we sort of assume it's the same in every direction. It's isotropic. But as you measure it better, you might notice it's a little bit more from over here and a little bit less from over there. And so you're starting to measure the anisotropy in that. And that's what you see in those co cosmic microwave background plots with all the, the colors sort of fading and coming as you're seeing the, the anisotropy in it. So there's a lot of physics hiding in that anisotropy. So we're still like years away from that, but that is the goal. Another great thing about this, we are seeing what we think is an ensemble of supermassive black holes, but there could be other things making gravitational waves. So there's a lot of people thinking about gravitational waves created basically at the Big Bang, primordial gravitational waves. So the cosmic microwave background is the oldest light in the universe. It comes from about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And any light that was emitted before then would have been reabsorbed by the plasma in the universe. So we, we literally can't see anything from before there. There's no light that has persisted today. But gravitational waves don't really interact with much. So if you had gravitational waves made microseconds after the Big Bang, or 10 to the minus 30 seconds after the Big Bang, right, the very beginning of the universe, they could still be hiding in this spectrum. We'd have to dig them out from under the black holes. But if we measure the black holes well enough, what's left over could be that primordial stuff. And that's really cool. Yeah, just kind of uh, piggybacking on that. Both the earlier talk and your talk, just there's no mention of JWST. Is that going to add to any of this? Are you looking forward to data over the next? decade or so uh, enhancing your models and stuff? so for that um so like we're looking at radio and jwst is measuring infrared and visible light so we're not we couldn't measure pulsars with it when we we might look for uh counterparts so maybe like this bump up here this deviation from the spectrum is because there's like an actual black hole binary that's a little bit louder than the rest sort of poking up above and so if we tried to go and find that with a telescope, I don't think JWST would be how we find it. So we would think about using like the big surveys where you like look at all the galaxies and look for things. But if you did find something, then pointing those giant, very sensitive telescopes at it would be exciting. But so not directly. Uh, we're more interested in like the, the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is like a big all sky survey of galaxies. Um, but Mentioned and maybe I misunderstood it, but I, I thought you had mentioned that a lot of this, these measurements are um, sort of contingent upon knowing where the center of mass of the galaxy is. Solar system. Of the of <laughs> the uh, solar system. Okay. Or what's the confidence level of that position over your period, or what is your it's, uncertainty? It's, How it's, is that factored in? It's kind of nuts. So. Nanographs, I should have, I could have put a plot of this in. Nanographs 11 year data set. 
uh, the orbit of Jupiter, the period of Jupiter's orbit is like 11 to 12 years. So there was sort of a resonance with our data set length in Jupiter's orbit. And so we had this excess dipolar correlated noise source that was uncertainty in the center of mass of the solar system. And it turned out that like NASA measures everything in the solar system very precisely. They put out uh, solar system ephemer ephemerities and ephemeris of like everything in the solar system, where it is at every time. We know where the moon is to centimeters. We know where Jupiter is to like kilometers. So based on that, we knew where the center of mass of the solar system was to like 500 meters. And that wasn't good enough. So Juno is a newer satellite at Jupiter right now. And the data coming in from Juno gets a much better position on Jupiter's orbit. And now we know where the center of mass of the solar system is to more like 100 meters. And that's good enough. So, yeah, so that's, yeah, we're, it's, it's wild. <laughs> So the data now and data in the future would help you find. Yeah, so we we actually so in with our eleven year data set, the JPL people who do that wanted our data to fold it into their like center of mass calculation, and we said no because we didn't want them to take our gravitational waves and turn them into center of mass of the solar system. So. Uh, so we we basically independently tried to fit that as a like we did a model where we simultaneously fit for where the center of mass of the solar system was and the gravitational waves to try to average over the uncertainty, uh, but we don't need to do that anymore because Juno is giving us better data. Yeah. So I'll bite. Uh, where is it, and would be a good place to visit? <laughs> uh, it's inside the sun most of the time. I think not all of the time, but almost all the time, ah, and probably so not. That's, <laughs> I think, it's close enough to the sun. Yes. Yeah, it is very close to the Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I'm going to substitute uh, a receiver when you see me change this telescope, or it's just uh, a really tiny lifespan so exists. Right. So, um, so Arecibo, we are currently covering all the Arecibo pulsars with GBT and VLA, mostly GBT. Um, to get, so all, I think the way the FAST, the 500 meter aperture spherical telescope is a 500 meter stationary dish in China. And the like proposal system, if I wanted to observe something with FAST, I would need to collaborate with people in China. Um, and so that can be challenging to do that. So they are, they've made their own pulsar timing array using FAST. So they observe pulsars and they don't share their data with anybody. They're not in the international pulsar timing array. Um, we would like them to be, but they don't want to join. They want to keep their data to themselves. That's their prerogative. Um, so I don't think, so... I think, yeah, it would be challenging for us to use FAST to do that using the thing that I, uh, where I went too far. I want to go to Chime. Chime is in Canada and it's a very weird little telescope. Oh, I'm going backwards. I want to go forwards. The very end. Um, and that is, so I, it's hard to see in the way the lighting isn't here but it is not a circular dish, it's a cylinder. It's half of a cylinder um, and it's stationary, and, but it, you can in software basically do beam forming. And so you can simultaneously observe multiple things overhead. And you basically can observe every pulsar in the Northern hemisphere every day as it passes overhead. And that's pretty cool. <laughs> so you don't get a lot of time. You only get a few minutes per pulsar, and with these things, we like to point them for about 20 minutes and really stare at it for a while. Uh, so each sort of daily point isn't super good, but you have a lot of them. So with uh, GBT and Arecibo and VLA, we try to observe most pulsars once a month. And with this every day, even though each point isn't super great, there's so many more of them that it works. And you can, yeah. So that's, I think for North America, in our collaboration, Chime's gonna be really important and just playing nice with the rest of our international partners. So Australia, Europe, India, South Africa, 
Um, so I think there's a few small telescopes in South America that might get involved, but yeah, the FAST doesn't want to share their data. So this is totally different, more of a personal question, because as a physics teacher, this is cool shit, right? Mm -hmm. And how, like, what was your path going from high school physics to college to get to doing what you're doing now? Like, how did you, like, you didn't know when you started off, yeah. probably as a physics major, this is where you're going to end up. So how did you end up in this exactly. So I actually, so my future PhD advisor did a colloquium where I was an undergrad. I went to undergrad at a little college in Oregon and uh, he was in Montana and came to do like our department colloquium and talked about WMAP. <laughs> so he did a lot of theoretical general relativity and cosmology and had worked on the microwave background stuff with WMAP and then was just starting to get into LISA the NASA space antenna, LIGO in space. Uh, so when I started working with him, that was sort of where he was focused. And when you're starting like a PhD, you kind of work on what your advisor says to work on. So that's how I got into gravitational waves. So NASA shut down the lease emission. They didn't have enough money. Uh, and so then we got into LIGO. And so that's how I got, and I worked on LIGO for years and initial LIGO before it was cool, before we detected anything, you know, um, so you were first exposed to this as an undergraduate? I didn't do any, I did, I didn't do any like research with gravitational waves as an undergrad, but I heard a colloquium about cosmology and general relativity that interested me. And that was what motivated me to apply to that particular grad school. And it was sort of, I don't know, serendipitous that I got into gravitational waves. So like, but it is, um, I don't know, trying to think of a good narrative to it it's fun i like it I, some of the the like day-to-day -day grind of data analysis is not fun but the sort of big picture stuff is fun and so you have to sort of focus on the big picture stuff every now and again any other questions you got a mic over there i just want to know where uh, china's located in canada um, and Picton, I want to say it's in BC, in, in Pen Penticton, yeah, Penticton. Um, in it's kind of by like Banff National Park, out in the middle of nowhere. You like to put things in the middle of nowhere. Not a lot of radio interference. You put them in. You want mountains to shield you from other stuff around you. That's why like Green Bank is in West Virginia, kind of buried in the hills. It is also there's a, a national radio quiet zone. So you're not allowed to have like any kind of radio broadcasts in the neighborhood of Green Bank, which helps a lot. I've got one question. What is the actual path length change of these pulsars? Oh man, uh, not very far. Let's see. So you figure from the, from the TOA residual. Right, you're right. So it's, it's this, the radio waves travel at the speed of light. If they are one microsecond late, then that, speed of light times one microsecond is three, three, three kilometers, three kilometers. There's <laughs> 300, 300 kilometers. Yeah, 300. Now what's the actual width of the pulse? Um, what is the width of a pulse? Um, and the microseconds? It varies. So we like pulsars that have very sharp features, even if the whole pulse is wide. So you think, so they rotate, say it rotates like once every five milliseconds. Then if the pulse is like 10% of that, then that would be uh, half a millisecond, I guess. You're detecting something that's not even as wide as the pulse. Right, yeah, the pulse, the whole pulse is moving. And that's why we want like, the pulses aren't nice little Gaussian blips. They're like jagged. And so you want ones that have really tall, jagged structure, so you can really hone in on the sharp thing. And so even though the whole pulse is wide, there's that sharp feature that's very narrow. And so that's how you get good times of arrival. 
All we have to do is measure a couple microseconds over 15 years and yeah. know the solar system varies yeah. to 100 meters. Yep. So in some of our, <laughs> yeah, some of our pulsars are better clocks than like the atomic clock standard on Earth. But not all of them, but a couple of them. I go and measure things in a fraction of a proton. Yes. Yeah. It's so hard, I guess. It is. Yeah. So it is, it, there's, there's a lot of patience, right? There's a lot of patience. And if I go back to this spectrum plot, so like LIGO, this strain is the change in distance divided by the total distance. So like LIGO is sensitive to things that are like 10 to the minus 22 change. And so, right, our supermassive binaries are louder. They're way up here, but it is harder to measure those long lived things. Got it. Any final questions? Let's thank Paul for his talk. Thank you so much. Your enthusiasm is absolutely contagious for this, something that most of us in this room didn't know really existed before tonight. So thank you very much. Okay, um, I want to thank you all for coming. We have one more thing on our agenda, which is our raffle. Um, I also like to mention that, uh, remind you that we do have our monthly Valley Forge Star Party, um, either tomorrow night or Sunday night. And we were looking at the weather before uh, before the meeting started, and it just isn't totally obvious which which night to pick. So we'll make the decision by noon tomorrow, whether we'll do it uh, tomorrow night. And so be sure you um, uh, keep in touch with the website if you're interested in coming to be sure uh, whether it's happening. And someone just brought some um, tickets up here. I wanted to thank Joseph Kraus, yes, for stepping in um, our... <laughs> Our usual um, raffle chair, Ken Kuppliger, couldn't be here tonight. And so um, Joe was nice enough to step in at the last minute. And thank you very much. You obviously did a good job. We have a lot of <laughs> All right. First one is 224009. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that means you can go over and select something from the uh, table. <laughs> two two four zero one one. Anyone? I got those solar filters. Awesome. Oh. <laughs> two two four zero one one. Nobody. Dominic's all right. That's very nice of you. Two two four zero zero two. All right. Let's <laughs> gift car. Two two four zero zero seven. The Craig again? <laughs> what? It's you again. <laughs> I must not be mixing these up well enough. You bought them. With Thank you for your donation. 224008, that's probably you too. <laughs> 224008, that's probably you too. But Tracy, doesn't she want to pick something up? <laughs> 224019. All right. 224019. All right. 
I'll do one more. 224015. <laughs> obviously, obviously, he's giving us a lot of money. He's, he's giving giving him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. I think we have, have a We'll see you all this weekend on the Valley Forge uh, model airplane field. And thanks so much um, for all of our visitors from the physics uh, teachers. And we hope to have your students submitting, submitting projects to us. To do what? To do what? To run from the reading. Oh, you did. Okay. Thank you very much. I also follow up on your thought of it. Okay, I'm going to need somebody to help me with that big heavy thing. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thomas. Oh, that. Thank you. Something that happened this week. That's usually. I don't know what was different. Hallelujah. So, Jeremy and I are hanging with physics people. So we're going